will be in Genesis chapter 50, finishing up the book this morning. And uh, as we finish up the quarter, and then uh, hopefully have time for a review of the book uh, at the end of class. Before we uh, begin, um, we received word that uh, Brother Bob Waldron passed away on Friday evening. So uh, those who don't know, he's the, he's the one who wrote uh, the book that we went through last quarter on teaching, and he is the one who uh, organized and set up the plan for the book. He wrote all the books that the teachers are using uh, for this uh, new program we're in this quarter, and uh, so uh, everything we're doing is based on his, uh, on his plan, his uh, program. So um, it, w- it was sad to hear that. He's a person who... Uh, has been uh, an extreme benefit to to me and my uh, understanding and study of the Bible. And uh, same for you. If you appreciate anything we're doing now, um, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to Brother Waldron for putting that together. So um, I don't. We we met him in a gospel meeting several years ago. Yeah. 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 Brother uh, or sister Sandra passed away number of years ago, so, yeah, so, all right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Almighty God and our Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, bringing us here together today to uh, study your word. We thank you for your word that you've given us. We thank you for the book of Genesis and all that we've been able to learn about you, to know you better, to uh, understand you, and to be able to serve you better. We pray that you will uh, be with us this morning in our classes. We pray that you'll be with us in our worship, that we will uh, glorify you today. Lord, we're thankful to you for uh, Brother Waldron, and we're thankful for uh, his ability, his uh, study and effort that he uh, put in to uh, benefit us, to help us in uh, knowing you better, and knowing your word, and to serve you better. We're so grateful for him. We're so grateful to you for... uh, uh, giving us him and his life and all the research. We pray that you will uh, be with uh, the family at uh, this time in their grief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Um, also, just wanted to mention to you guys, I uh, really appreciate uh, everything that's going on in the classes. Not only up here, I've definitely enjoyed uh, the quarter, enjoyed all the discussions that we've had, um, and enjoyed seeing there's really good things happening in the classes downstairs. Um, Definitely uh, appreciate a lot of things that are happening. If if you don't know, um, like the littlest kids, the kids in the very littlest classes have been uh, memorizing a large section of Hebrews 11. Um, They haven't quite, they're not memorizing all of it, but of course a large part of the, you know, up to the first 22 verses are talking about Genesis. So they've been memorizing that. I don't think they're quite there, but... (laughs) Uh, they're close to memorizing the first 22 verses. That, that's amazing. Uh, talking about the the, the, uh, the littlest kids in the classes. Um, there's been uh, I've taught, you know, Heather and Amanda have been doing a great job in that class. I know Heather did a really cool thing when uh, the uh, the family of Jacob, the wives and his 12 sons, where she actually, she got out. Uh, Barbies and dolls and color-coded the, uh, the mothers to the sons to help the kids understand. Uh, so a lot of good things. I was talking to uh, Vince the other day and telling him how much Isaac is always telling me how much he enjoys his class. And, uh, and I said he was doing a great job. And he said, how do you know? And I said, the way I know is because after worship, I see all the young men crowded around talking to him and building that relationship with a godly man. And these are extremely valuable things both in and outside of the class. And so really appreciate everyone's uh, effort, everyone's, uh, uh, I guess, buy-in to what we're doing, and I think, I think there's a lot of really good things going on. Um, okay, so in Genesis, we've been covering throughout the quarter um, what, introdu- what Genesis introduces about the nature of God and the nature of man, who God is, how uh, this applies our relationship to him, and then with our relationship to him, then to one another. Uh, we've talked about God and his faithfulness to his promises and uh, helping to understand, first of all, how this would, uh, uh, the original readers of Genesis would have understood this story and then how it's our story as well. We've talked about this idea from the beginning of Genesis of God's original intent to have the people of God in the place of God dwelling in the presence of God 
And of course, uh, that was his original intent, which was uh, destroyed very quickly by man's sin, and then how God is working to restore uh, all of these things. Okay, so when we got to chapter 48 and 49, which we covered uh, on Wednesday, so these are critical, those are critical Bible chapters that are going to set up a lot of things that are going to happen really throughout the rest of the Bible, but certainly throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Um, so just a couple things. As we think back about chapter 48 and 49, we see in both cases uh, Jacob pronouncing blessings. So which son of Jacob received the birthright? Okay, yes, Joseph. <laughs> I was hoping for someone else other than the teacher to answer that. All right, someone turn to 1 Chronicles 5 and verse 1. All right, they, we, uh, we referred to this on Wednesday, but turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 5. So we can see that, we can, we can infer that based on what it said in chapter 48, but 1 Chronicles 5 tells us exactly what happened there. Someone, when they get to 1 Chronicles 5, verse 1. Um. And sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's couch, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he could not be enrolled as the oldest son. Okay, so in verse Chronicles 5, it's going back and talking about the sons and their inheritance, and it starts talking about Reuben, but then it stops and says, even though he's the oldest, he doesn't get the birthright. Okay, and specifies, which again, it tells us in Genesis, because of this, his sin with Bilhah. Okay, so because of that, he doesn't get it, and so it goes to Joseph. The birthright goes to Joseph. So, uh, so in giving the birthright to Joseph, what is the result to Joseph's sons? Who were Joseph's sons? Ephraim and Manasseh. So what is the result to them? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, you said they're second? Yes, okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so, okay. So, first of all, so both of them, uh, Jacob makes them his sons. Okay? So, they become sons to Jacob. So, essentially adopting them and then giving them an equal portion with his sons. Okay? So, in that way... Joseph gets a double portion, right? You see that? Because each of his sons are going to be counted as sons of Jacob, all right? And so that's an idea that's going to follow all the way through, right? So they're going to be, so when we have the uh, tribes of, uh, the tribes of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh are full tribes because they've been enrolled as sons of Jacob, okay? Okay. I don't know where that came from. Yeah. Why we said that. So based on this, I would disagree with that. They were made sons of Jacob. And they get full portion. In fact, it's, it's, it's important because they're actually very important. <laughs> Tribes. <laughs> Tribes. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So then, as was mentioned, which son of Joseph got the preferred blessing? Ephraim. Right? Even though he was the youngest, he gets the preferred bl br blessing over Manasseh. Okay? All right, so that, uh, that is all chapter 48. In chapter 49, what other son of Jacob besides Joseph received a special blessing? By the way, just quickly, jo it's interesting. We talk about the blessings on, uh, in chapter 49. Only one of them actually says it's a blessing, <laughs> and that's Joseph. Okay? Joseph is the only one where it actually says it's a blessing. All right, but which other son receives a special one? Yes. Judah. Yes, Judah. Okay. So Judah. All right, so if you're still, hopefully, if someone's still in First Chronicles 5, read verse 2. Yeah, a tongue. So Judah affirmed his brothers, and from him came the leader, yet the birthright belongs to Joseph. Right. Okay, so you see that? So this is this idea that we've already been talking about with Judah, that we've seen him rising to become a leader in his family. All right, and he, uh, even though he started out very poorly, he becomes a, a leader in the family, and so he gets a special blessing as well, but it's not the birthright, all right? Okay, so, he, so in, in chapter 49, when it talks about the blessing uh, to Judah, verses uh, 8 through 12, remember we talked about the scepter, 
uh, the, the idea of the rule and authority, and, the, and of course we know from that the kings will come from him, starting with, with David. Uh, and then from there on, uh, there will always be, as was promised to David, there would always be one of, from his line on the throne. Okay, the idea of lion, we talked about the, the imagery of, of the lion, the, uh, the power, and the authority that would come from the lion, that that would be a symbol in David's uh, kingship, uh, and then, of course, a symbol of Christ. So, um, so and when we look at these, the rest of the Old Testament follows these promises. These are, these are not just blessings, these are prophecies, okay, promises in a sense. And so the rest of the Old Testament follows this prophecy being fulfilled to Judah because, uh, starting with David, uh, there's going to be a king from uh, David's lineage and therefore from Judah's, from the tribe of Judah, throughout uh, <clears throat> the entire uh, Israel's entire history. And then, of course, ultimately the fulfillment is going to be in Jesus. Okay, because Jesus is going to be the ultimate fulfillment of the promise to David, and therefore the promise to uh, Judah. All right. So these are things that follow throughout, and then, and it's also, by the way, interesting. There's a start here. Maybe it's actually already started, but there's a start here of a rivalry between Ephraim and Judah. Okay, it's already started a little bit because you had this Judah, you know, when Joseph was young, and Judah being the one to sell him, uh, to, to have the idea to sell him. Uh, but ultimately, when you go, think about, think about fast forward through the United Kingdom and you get to the kingdom dividing, the southern kingdom will be called what? Judah, because it basically consists of the tribe of Judah, <laughs> all right? The northern kingdom will be called Israel, but if you start looking over time, it just becomes referred to as Ephraim, right? There'll be the prophets and so on, and people will just talk about the northern kingdom as Ephraim because Ephraim what became like the strongest, uh, the strongest tribe. And so these, these blessings, these ideas that we're seeing here are just things that, are, that we can follow all through the Old Testament. Okay? Yes? Yeah, I'm interested in the nation building. You said such a situation would be bad, but you can see that in the priest, which we are. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. All right, so that's kind of, a, I think, a helpful little review. Going in then to chapter 50, of course, at the end of chapter 49, we have uh, Jacob's uh, death. Uh, and as we come to chapter 50, then, 50 we, see the, we see the mourning uh, for, for Jacob, starting with Joseph. Joseph falling on his father's way, face, weeping over him and kissing him. Um, and, uh, and then there's a description all... Uh, all the way through chapter 14 of the mourning that happens for Jacob. And there's a lot of uh, interesting details here, um, starting with the fact that uh, Joseph commands uh, his servants, the physicians. Who, so who would his servants, the physicians, be? Egyptians. Yeah, these are Egyptians, okay? <laughs> so we might gloss over that and think about that, but these are Egyptians, and their job is to embalm his father. All right, now we know a lot about Egyptian embalming, of course, because of uh, what an amazing process it was, and we can see that through archaeology and everything that's been restored uh, in, in, uh, in Egypt. And so we know a lot about that, but so Jacob here essentially is going to get an Egyptian embalming, okay, because it's being done by the Egyptians according to their, to their process. All right, so that's a, that's a 40-day process, verse 3. Uh, tells us uh, that, that he goes through with this embalm, embalming, and then the Egyptians weep for him 70 days. Okay, so 70 days of official mourning by the Egyptians for Jacob, uh, the, uh, the, the father of Joseph. So we start to see all these, uh, these details then about what happens then as uh, Joseph and the family and the Egyptians all mourn uh, for Jacob. What are some of those details? What are some of the things that it tells us about this, what happened, this process of uh, mourning for Jacob? Okay. Yeah, okay, so first of all, yeah, so Joseph uh, asked for permission from Pharaoh to go back to the land because as uh, Jacob uh, had made him promise, 
that he would uh, take him back and bury him in Israel with his, uh, with his fathers, with his family, okay? So does Pharaoh give him permission? Yeah. Yes, he does. And we notice the stark contrast when Joseph dies because that no longer applies when, when, when he dies. But for his father, uh, he definitely uh, has the support of uh, Pharaoh, but it makes a special note that he left all his stuff behind, <laughs> the, the kids and the flocks and yeah. and, and, uh, and all his uh, you know, belongings. Yeah, so this is, yeah, so Pharaoh not only gives him permission, he kind of goes above and beyond, right? And he gives him, uh, he gives him all kinds of things to take on the journey. Jesse? Mm -hmm. Except for the little ones and the animals. Yes, all right, so it talks about the servants. Pharaoh sends his own servants. Own servants him. with him, okay? As well uh, as elders, elders of the, uh, of the Egyptians, and chariots and horsemen. So yeah, all in is a good description. I mean, this is, it talks about a great company that leaves to take him, uh, take him back to the land, okay? And then all of Joseph's and Jacob's uh, household uh, go with him, okay? Yeah. Right. And it's going to be a lot of Egyptians that are coming. <laughs> yeah. And so as far as people are concerned, this is a morning for the Egyptians. Exactly, yeah. So the Canaanites notice the morning, and they get, as she said, they see them as Egyptians. Um, the ver in, uh, in verses 9 through 11, the word great is used three times, a great morning, all right? That has the idea of, of, uh, of it's heavy, right? This is, this is a heavy uh, event, a great, a great morning. Okay, and ultimately, uh, when you when you look at everything that's going on here, and all the people that are uh, going, and and you know, as you said, allowed to go, uh, it, it appears to be a royal burial, right? This is like a royal procession to, to bury someone. This is the way, uh, and, and it shows um, this respect that the people that the Egyptians themselves have for uh, Joseph, that they would treat his father. Uh, that way, okay? Now, as we talked about, turn the page to Exodus <laughs> next quarter, that's going to change, okay, Over the, because there's a lot of time is going to pass. But at this point, we, again, we, as we've seen already, we see this respect that they have uh, for, uh, for Joseph to, to, to treat him and to treat his family this way, okay? What do you see on Joseph's part related to this, to going back and burying his father and everything? What do we see about his character? Yeah. Okay, the prophecy, yes. Yeah. Well, he's warned his father that he would. Yeah, all right, so he's, he's, he's focusing on keeping his promise, right? He's warned his father, he's going to do it, he's going to keep his promise, all right? So we see him uh, in this way acting in the image of God, right? This is what we've seen throughout the chapter, that God always keeps his word, God's word always comes true. Man frequently doesn't, but in this case, Joseph is acting in the image of God by, you know, keeping his promise, right. making sure he does what he said he would uh, for his father, okay? Anything else through verse 14? Comments? Yeah, I thought it was interesting that Joseph is number two in the land, but he still recognizes Pharaoh's number one, and he asked for permission to yeah. do all of that. Mm -hmm. So I think he had a Healthy respect for authority. Yeah. Even though he was one mm -hmm. in great authority himself. Yeah, and like we said throughout, in a lot of ways, Pharaoh has deferred to, <laughs> to uh, Joseph, but he doesn't assume anything. Yeah. But yes. But he doesn't ask Pharaoh. He asks Pharaoh's advisors for the household of Pharaoh. I can't remember uh, what the other versions say. Yeah, he might, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Maybe it's not easy to get an audience, even for Joseph, get an audience with Pharaoh himself. Yeah, that's true. That's interesting. Okay. All right. So uh, after this, uh, then, after this, then uh, they come back, and as we pointed out, then he returns. It, the, the 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 his family, the little ones, were still there in Egypt, so they do uh, return. And when they return, what's the what's the problem? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, that's right. His brothers are afraid at that point that his brother that Joseph's going to kill him. Why would they? Why would they be afraid of that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, but that was a while ago, right? A lot's happened since back then. What? Yeah. All right, Daddy's dead. All right. So they're afraid that Joseph was just being nice to them because Jacob was still alive. And now that Jacob's gone, Joseph is going to seek his revenge on them, okay? And so they're afraid he's going to kill him, which is amazing. Again, we talked about this, how long they lived with what they did if, in, in you know, 20 years. And it talks about how, you know, uh, Joseph's pleas and his cries were ringing in their ears that whole time. And now it's still in the back of their mind <laughs> even this whole time, uh, <clears throat> even though Joseph has been so nice to them. It's still in the back of their mind that he's going to try to get revenge for that. <clears throat> yep. Yes, <clears throat> that's correct. Uh, uh, yeah. And this is why Joseph got, you know, the blessing because what was he about? He's about God, <clears throat> and his brothers are about fear. Yeah. And that, that great lesson for all of us. Yep. Is you know if we're about God. We don't need to be about. Well, very well said. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes. Uh, correct. And, and I will say, it's interesting, <clears throat> the way they bring it up to him, what do they say when they, de they determine they're going to go talk to Joseph, and what do they say? <clears throat> I'm sorry? Lies. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Jesse, is that what you were going to? Well, yeah, <laughs> yes, okay, yeah, so they're, yeah, they're well aware of what they've done, and then when they go to Joseph, they say um, that this is what your, your, your father, <laughs> also their father, but this is what your father said to us, uh, to that, uh, that please forgive their transgression because they did evil to you. Now, if, if, if Jacob actually said that to them, it's not recorded in the scriptures. It seems like they're making up another lie. Okay. Um, regardless, what is Joseph's response? Well, because they intended all of that. Now, please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the gods. Mm -hmm. of your mm -hmm. So they still it. Yeah, in other words, yes. <laughs> Your father said this, he's a servant of God, so you need to do what he said to do, all right? Even though, again, there's a real question about whether he actually actually said that, okay? What is Joseph's response? I'm sorry? He wept. He wept. Okay, yes? Yes, all right, so, yes. So the first thing he says is, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? What do you mean by that? Yeah, he's not the judge. Again, he's not presuming, right? He's, we've seen him throughout his life giving credit to God. He's not, and we, and we talked about this from the beginning, that, uh, that vengeance belongs to who? To God, okay? And so he's still, that's what he means when he says, am I in the place of God? In other words, it's not my place to seek vengeance. God is the judge, and so he's not going to take... Uh, the, try to take the place of God in that way. All right, but then he says, uh, verse 20, um, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Okay, a huge verse what he says right there. Okay, a huge verse in, in understanding this. All right, so Joseph's concern has always been genuine, right? He wasn't faking anything because his father was alive. Right? He genuinely had genuine concerns. So the tears and the weeping that he'd done before was all genuine. All right? And then in verse 20, he, said, he talks about, he said, he, he, he's going back. He recognizes, even though they don't know what it's saying, he said, what you did in the past, okay, in other words, throwing him into the pit, intending to kill him, selling him as a slave, all these terrible things that they did in the past, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What did he mean by that? Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. God, God meant it for good. Yeah. What's being handed down from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph was staying on course for a lot of times people in the same family get distracted. Yeah. Yes. All right. So this is yeah. So this is a continuing theme. Uh, all right. So if in other words, if God, in other words, what he's saying is you did something evil, but God is controlling this whole thing. That's right. And God meant it to bring about good. If he wasn't in Egypt, then he's not there to interpret the dreams. And if he's not there to interpret the dreams, then they're not saving up food right. and saving people alive. All right. So he talks about to save many people alive. Okay. God used this event to save people and not just the Egyptians to save right. their own family, right. right? And to save many people from other countries who were coming, all nations around who were coming to buy food from the Egyptians, all right? So God used this, their evil to do good, okay? And then look at what he, Jesse, go ahead. The guy says something about God's will as well. If you go back to like the story of the Tower of Babel, that man wanted to do one thing, but, but God's will is going to be done in the same way. They tried to end Joseph's story, his prophecy, but it didn't end. Right. Yes, exactly, right? So, so, so then he concludes and he says, do not fear, right? They're living in fear. He says, don't fear, I will provide for you and your family. Right, which he already has, right? which he already has been. But he's going to continue to do that, right? So to, your, to, to the point you guys are making, this is the story of Joseph. This is what the entire story of Joseph has been about, right? People doing evil, evil, and, and not just his brothers, right? Other people throughout his story do evil to him, do him wrong through no fault of his own. And yet God is taking all these evil things that are happening and intending it for good, right? As, yeah, Dale. Families have problems. All families have siblings that argue, and the kids have problems with the way their parents raised them. Everyone makes mistakes, but it's a good lesson for us about, you know, for family forgiveness. Yeah. I've seen families treat siblings horribly and never talk to them again. I've seen families treat parents horribly and never speak to them again. And it's just a, a good sign of having forgiveness in your heart for mistakes we all make. Yes, yes, thank you. And, and, and we've seen these sibling rivalries throughout this family, right? Throughout the book of Genesis, we've seen these sibling rivalries, and so oftentimes they've gone wrong, and this, and these, and it's gotten to, and it kind of hit this lowest point here with the sons of Jacob, and yet Joseph turns that all around by being willing to forgive. Okay? And, okay. And, be, and, and so we see the family being able to come back together. Uh, despite being fractured, despite being sinful, because Joseph is willing to forgive. So, yes, thank you. Okay, And in some ways, even beyond Joseph, then, this is a summary statement about, of the book of Genesis. You think about this, right? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to keep many people alive. Right? Yeah. Yeah, we want to read that? Exactly. According to his purpose, right? God causes all things to work together for good. All things means even the bad things, right? So if we're working according to God's purpose, as we've seen Joseph doing throughout his life, if we're working according to God's purpose, all the things, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? People ask that question all the time. There's multiple answers to that question. But one answer is this. One answer is this, because in the big picture of things, God is working everything, even the bad things, to be good for people, for those who serve him, right? And Joseph is a picture of that. Joseph could have spent most of his life asking, why do all these bad things keep happening to me through no fault of my own, all right? But at the end of his life, it's extremely clear why all those bad things happen to him, okay? And he sees that, and he recognizes that, all right? Beautiful, yes, Jesse. Forgiveness, a little window into his thinking by the, the names of his children, you know, because one, one was forgetting, Forgetting, and he credited that to God, and then that part of of, of, of being for, of forgiving, and the second child Ephraim was was being fruitful, and yeah. giving credit to God as well, and that that was the key to his success, and ours as well. Exactly, both of those names recognized God bringing him through the difficult difficult times with his sons. Yes, all right, good. All right, <clears throat> beyond that, this is ultimately the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus. 
As we've been saying, Joseph is a, uh, is a picture of Jesus for us. All right, this is the story of, of Jesus. How would you think the phrase, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good? How does that apply to Jesus? I'm sorry? Yeah, in, in his death, right? Yeah, Brenda, what were you? Exactly. And they did. <laughs> they actually succeeded. They actually did kill Jesus, but God still meant that for good. Right? And so that's, and so that's ultimately the, the point here. It's really the story of the Bible. En- encapsulated in one verse. <laughs> you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. People do evil things in this life, but God means it for good. And certainly for good to those who serve him. Right? Uh, Joel? Do you have your hand up? No. Over several pages, but Ephesians talks all the time about the plan that people don't understand, didn't understand. Uh, and that was the beginning of the plan back in Genesis, and it continues today. We don't understand everything that's going on and, and how God uh, blesses people um, not in isolation. But like you said, if all things fit together, even the bad things, yeah. God understands that we don't. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah. well said. All right, so the last section then, the last section of the chapter, the last section of the book is the death of Joseph. All right, so, All right, before, so Joseph, before Joseph dies, we see one final act of faith on Joseph, and what is that? Or by Joseph. Yes, all right, so he, like, uh, <clears throat> similar to Jacob, requests that his bones be taken back. He knows he's going to die there, but requests his bones be taken back. What's different about, his, about Joseph's compared to Jacob's? Okay, time, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so instead of immediately after his death, going back, uh, he says, look what he says in verse 24. God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Okay, then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. All right, you see what he's saying? What's he talking about? I'm sorry, say it louder. The Exodus, all right, yeah. He's prophesying and showing his faith in the Exodus. You will bring my bones back to the promised land, all right? And that's exactly what Hebrews 11.22 says, right? That Joseph, in this event, spoke of the Exodus. That's what it says, right? Because he did. He's talking about, he's prophetically speaking of the Exodus, showing his faith, continuing showing his faith in the land promise, right? All right, and that's, and that's how the book ends with, again, another act of faith by Joseph, Predicting the next the next book, yes. That's right. Yes, thank you. Good point. He spent equally his whole adult life in Egypt, living as an Egyptian, and yet he still understood that this was about the land, not about Egypt, right? The promise was going to be through the land of Canaan, okay? And he's, and he's still focused on that. Good, all right? So our last, our, so key point for this lesson is just what we just talked about, in my mind, just what we talked about, verse 20, right? Men do evil, but God does good. And, and, and even God does good, even using men's evil to accomplish good, not just for himself, but for men. Okay, specifically for those who serve him, but for, to keep people alive, right? There were people who weren't necessarily serving him at all, but were kept alive because of what happened through, uh, through Joseph. So he said, this is the story of Genesis. It's the story of the Bible. And the question for us is, is it my story? Am I like Joseph showing faith, righteousness compared to God so that God could bless me even through the difficult, the bad things that happen in life? Okay. Yes.
does not like to see the merit prompts. He hates the merit prompts. He ain't so good. Yes, very good. All right. I can always count on you to bring us back to the merit prompts. Uh, yeah, that's, but it's, it's true. It's, it's very, true. very important. You're right. Uh, all right. So, all right. I want us to spend the rest of our time then uh, just talking about the book in general, uh, reviewing things about Genesis. Mm -hmm. So, I asked you for those who, who saw the or who had the assignment, what themes and repeated concepts have we seen throughout the book of Genesis? So, I'm leaving it up to you guys. Yes, Karen. One thing we see a lot is deceitfulness. Okay. <laughs> deceitfulness. And who is deceitful? <laughs> All of them. Yes. Okay, yeah, starting with Satan, right? And then people act in the image of Satan throughout the book. Okay? By being deceitful. Good. All right. What else? Covenant. Covenants, good, yes. All right, so, so a lot of covenants in the book, right? Without using the word, probably, again, starting with Adam and Eve, we see the pieces of a covenant there, but then we see an actual covenant with Noah, with Abraham, and then with all the sons of uh, Abraham, yes? Sin brings death. Okay, sin brings death, how? Well, initially, that spiritual death, they were kicked out of the garden. Okay. Um, and, then, and then in the flood, when sin became rampant, the death of all humanity, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So sin has many consequences. <clears throat> the, mo the most clear is death. Okay. And so we see uh, <clears throat> uh, all men will die, and specifically those who are not walking with God. We see uh, the death that their death. Okay. Good. Yes. Well, yeah, the spiritual death is what you see in Adam yeah. and Eve, and then physical death is blood. Yes. So both of those Right. Uh, Jesse. The concept of the firstborn is, is, is constantly, the firstborn is constantly being overturned. I mentioned that mm -hmm. Wednesday, and Jesus himself is referred to as the firstborn from among all creation. Yes. All right, so we have this idea of firstborn, but we also have this idea of the firstborn, born, the firstborn not being the preferred. All right, again and again, the younger is the one preferred. All right, the New Testament's going to talk about that as well. But Jesus yeah. is, is, is the firstborn. Good. All right. What else? Free will. Free will? Okay, good. Good. God giving us free will. So there's free will. God created us with free will, but there's consequences of those choices throughout. Right? Yes, Justin. Being fruitful. Okay, being fruitful. Good. All right? Start again, starting from creation, right? From the very beginning, right? The command to, to be fruitful. Good. All right? What else? Amanda? God's powerful enough to be in control even though he gave us free will. Okay. Yes, God's power. Learning, God, we learn about God when God's power, that He's in control of everything. Tom, that, uh, those who are have this covenant relationship with God will be blessed. Okay. Yes, blessed and blessing. All right. So let me throw two out because they're on the slide. I'm going to go back to one before it. There's this idea of seed. All right. So the word seed or translated offspring, depending on. Translation is 48 times in the book. Okay? So the idea of a seed, something small that grows, okay? So the book of Genesis itself could be considered the seed, right? It's the seed of the whole book of the Bible. We talked about how it's introducing us to all these concepts, right? Covenant and firstborn, all these things that it's introducing. So the, the book itself is like a seed. We see the idea of from the beginning in Genesis 1. You know, uh, God giving uh, things reproduce according to its kind by its seed. All right, and then frequently translated offspring. So um, a lot in the book about uh, seed. Of course, you get to Abraham, and through his seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. So it, Genesis is planting seeds for us <laughs> that are going to follow throughout the book. And then what you mentioned, the word blessing, bless or blessing, is 72 times in the book. Okay? Again, the, going all the way back to creation, God blesses things, starting with the animals, starting with Noah from the very beginning, God blesses things. And then um, God blesses his people, okay? God pr pronounces blessings on different people throughout, those who are walking with him specifically, he blesses. And then those people bless other people, right? So we see the blessings that are handed down, uh, uh, Isaac and Jacob are handing down blessings, but those blessings are actually prophecies from God. 
right? So those who are blessed by God use their blessings to bless others, right? Remember Abraham, you are being blessed to be a blessing, okay? Right, so, so the blessing is extremely important throughout the book. All right, other ideas uh, or, or themes, yes? It's kind of subtle, but the, the, break, the breakdown of the book is in generations. Yes. You, know, you see in creation is, is seven days, and then in order to create redemption for man, he, he, creates, he creates it in generations. Yes, all right, good. So the book organizes itself. These are the generations, starting with the generations of the earth, okay? And then the generations of the people, good. All right, other themes, yes? Well, a lot of the, the, they never stayed in one place. They would stay in one place and they would move to another place. They moved to another place. Okay. Because, All right. because yep. God just say, I need you to go here or there. They would be going into land. So it, to me, it was like moving out of wherever they were at to go into the land. <clears throat> good, good. Excellent. All right, let me hit you with a couple others quick. The importance of who you marry. All right, again, the book starts with God creating marriage. Uh, instituting marriage for us, and then it's talking over and over again about the consequences that happen from our choice of who we marry. Usually in the book, it's a negative consequence because a person chooses a negative person to marry. <laughs> Occasionally, it's a good thing. Uh, they, they choose well. But the important, again and again, the importance of who you marry. All right, God's words never fail. All right, so we talked about man. Men are frequently deceitful, but in contrast to God, whose words never fail. God's promises always come true. Remember, God sees, hears, and remembers. We saw all of those concepts. God cares. God looks down and sees us. He cares. He cares even for those who are uh, being uh, oppressed. <clears throat> God will punish disobedience. We talked about that. And ultimately then, <clears throat> from the beginning, God made us in his image. So those who act in God's image will imitate him. Okay? So, so many people were deceitful. Joseph was not. Right? Joseph is the one who acts in, in God's image, okay? And so hopefully, again, seen through Joseph, we were created to be rulers. We were created to have dominion, but not for our own power, not for our own glory. We were created to be rulers to accomplish God's will. And again, that's what we see in, in, uh, in Joseph, that Joseph kind of ends the book where God started it, that he created us to have dominion, to have rule, but to accomplish his will on this earth, to use that in a good, positive way. So Joseph is the example for that. He rises to be a ruler, and he ultimately accomplishes, God accomplishes his own will through Joseph as the ruler. Okay? Yeah? Well, you know, also that the earth itself was not the top of God's will. Man was. Yes. Humanity is the top. Yes. Not the earth. Yes. All of this, God created everything for man. For the per Man was the highest part of creation. God created it for him. All right, we've got one minute left. What's, one, what's something that you've learned from our study together that you want to tell me? I told you and uh, you and Tom last week, but one of the things that jumps out at me in this study is how impressed I was with Gene's comment a few weeks ago about the fact that Abraham and Noah were contemporary. I never looked at it like that, and I've read about it since in a lot of commentaries, commentators feel out of it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and so, yeah, exactly, so, thank you, good point, so we, if you think about it, we just covered half of human history, uh, roughly, very roughly, okay, but <laughs> amazing, we, like, we just covered it in one quarter, and it goes fast, but in human, terms of human history, we just covered half of it, very good, all right, thank you, again, appreciate everything, we're out of time, uh, no assignment for Tuesday, <laughs> we will stay, take over starting in, uh, Tom will take over starting in Exodus on Tuesday. Wednesdays, Wednesdays.